Hi there. My name is Cameron, and I read comics. Today, you are listening to the very first episode of Cameron Reads Comics, the podcast. So I want to go over a couple things with you that you should know going in. Number one, this is my first podcast. I created it because I wanted to talk about comics and find an outlet where I can talk about comics with my friends. So here we are. But one of the hurdles with that is I have purchased and taught myself as much as I can about sound editing and sound quality, and I'm still working on it. So some of the sound quality you're going to hear in this episode isn't as great as other podcasts that you've heard. So be warned. It's going to get better over time, but this is still our very first episode. Um, also, it is our second attempt at trying to record this. So we start off and we lost eight minutes of recording because I clicked the wrong button. And like I said, it's a learning curve. So we come in and we say round two because it was actually our second round. Now, going into the content on the podcast, this is your spoiler warning now for Mr. Miracle by Tom King and Mitch Garrods. We go in-depth on Scott Free and Big Barda's adventures, so you've been warned now if you have not already read it. We also spoil a little bit of Tom King's other works, Heroes in Crisis and Batman. And I get so passionate about what I'm talking about that I curse a little bit. So... You are warned if you are a younger viewer or a parent with younger viewers. Now, let's get into the podcast. Here is some context into the world of the new gods because this is an intimidating franchise. So, here we go. The new gods are natives of the twin planets of New Genesis and Apocalypse. New Genesis is an idyllic planet filled with unspoiled forests, mountains, and rivers, and it's ruled by the benevolent High Father, while Apocalypse is a nightmarish, polluted, and ruined dystopia filled with machinery and fire pits and is ruled by and is ruled by the tyrannical dark side. The gods of New Genesis, led by High Father, dedicate themselves to all that was good and decent. Darkseid rules the planet Apocalypse with an iron fist and searches for the Anti-Life Equation. The Anti-Life Equation holds the power to destroy hope itself. This led the two planets to go to war. After billions of lives lost, High Father and Darkseid came to an agreement, a ceasefire brought to fruition by the two leaders exchanging their infant sons. The son of the devil would be brought to paradise, and the son of God would be cast down to hell. Darkseid's son Orion was raised in New Genesis and taken care of by High Father, and High Father's son Scott Free would be raised in the X Pit and forged into a warrior on Apocalypse. Orion was coddled, and Scott Free was tortured and maimed. Scott would try to run away from the horror of his life, but would constantly be getting caught. This led Scott Free to become Mr. Miracle, the world's greatest escape artist. Scott eventually leaves Apocalypse. He marries one of the women that he grew up with on Apocalypse, named... He, he marries one of the women that he grew up with on Apocalypse, a member of Granny Goodness's female furies, Big Barda. With the help of his teacher and friend Oberon... Scott Free becomes one of the greatest performers of all time. No prison can hold him. No trap can contain him. He is Scott Free, the worldwide celebrity sensation known as Mr. Miracle. And he is the greatest escape artist who ever lived. But can he pull off the ultimate trick and escape death itself? Now for our story, and this is where the spoilers begin. The story opens with Scott free with his wrists slit on the floor of his bathroom. Scott reminisces through a story of a child in school who draws a picture of God. The teacher tells the child, no one knows what God looks like. And the child responds, until now. Scott gets patched up and lets the world know that it was a publicity stunt. Can the world's greatest escape artist escape death itself? So he tried to kill himself. Meanwhile, High Father reports to Scott, 
that he placed a mole in Apocalypse who informed him that Darkseid has taken hold of the anti-life equation. Scott has imaginary conversations with the recently deceased Oberon. Oberon repeats the story about the child in the face of God to Scott as a joke. Bardo walks in on Scott's conversation to ask who he's talking to. When he says Oberon, Bardo has to remind Scott that Oberon isn't alive anymore. Metron appears to Scott as he's sleeping to warn him that he is not to know the face of God. The forces of New Genesis and Apocalypse are at war. Scott and Barda are called to fight for New Genesis. Highfather dies and Orion is placed as the new Highfather and head of New Genesis. Orion demands that Scott and Barda assassinate their mother, Granny Goodness. When Scott meets with her, Granny reveals that she was Highfather's mole. Barda kills Granny Goodness. Forager visits Scott and Barda in their apartment. He declares that he can't follow Orion's leadership any longer and chooses to follow Scott free. Lightray bursts through a boom tube and murders Forager in front of Scott. Scott thinks that Orion has been infected by the anti-life equation. When Scott goes to talk to Orion, Orion asks Scott if he's ever seen the face of God. Orion beats Scott, declaring his face is the face of God. Orion holds a trial at Scott and Barda's apartment, asking a series of personal and unreasonable true-false questions. Orion insinuates that Scott is the anti-life equation because all Scott feels is hate. The anti-life equation is the embodiment of hate. Scott lashes out at Orion and punches him in the face. The trial ends and Orion decides that he is going to execute Scott. Scott and Barda spend one last day together and decide that Scott isn't going to get executed. They are going to fight Orion for his life. As they fight their way through the throne room on New Genesis, Barda and Scott talk about redoing their condo. This conversation takes place throughout the entire issue from room to room. It is revealed that Barda's intention is to create more space in their tiny apartment because they're going to need more room. She's pregnant. By the time they make it into the throne room, Scott finds Orion dead at the hands of Darkseid. Terrified, he tells Barda that he has seen the face of God, and Scott is now deemed the new High Father. Barda's water breaks, and Scott and her race to the hospital. Barda's former teammates, the female Furies, are in the waiting room. Due to the baby being born as a new god and Barda's immortality, Earth's instruments are not strong enough to break Barda's skin. Bernadeth gives Scott the Farron knife. It kills gods and can penetrate Barda's skin. Scott's child is born, and his umbilical cord is wrapped around his neck. The Farron knife cuts the cord so that the child survives the birth. Scott names his child Jacob after the ladder that he used to escape from Apocalypse. The war between New Genesis and Apocalypse rages on, and Scott's forces are depleting. Him and Barda can't occupy the same territory because someone needs to be home watching Jacob. Eventually, Scott goes to Apocalypse to meet with Calabac and come to an agreement about ending the war. They talk about prisoner exchanges, troop withdrawal, etc. Scott and Barda enjoy bone wine for the first time in a long time. It's wine made out of the bones of fallen new gods. After six tedious days of bureaucracy... Calabac comes with one final offer. Darkseid is willing to withdraw all forces, return all prisoners, and surrender the anti-life equation for one thing. Custody of Jacob Free. Scott and Barda's newborn would become the heir of Apocalypse. Scott and Barda avoid talking about the discussion in their laps. Scott tries to run his dilemma by different people he has interactions with. Booster Gold and Blue Beetle... The guy at the party store while preparing for Jacob's birthday. When Scott prized Barda about giving Jacob up, saying they turned out fine in spite of their upbringing on Apocalypse, Barda brings up the fact that Scott has tried to kill himself. Scott, coming to terms with what he did, says he had to do it. To escape. Barda doesn't understand. Was he trying to escape her and their life together? They fight, and Scott comes to the decision that they'll plan to hand Jacob over and instead kill Darkseid. Barda says she's coming too. Scott and Barda end up in the throne room of Darkseid with Jacob. They hand the child to Darkseid 
and his right-hand man Desaad. Because they delivered Jacob, Darkseid rips out his eye, which contains the anti-life equation. As Scott hugs Jacob goodbye, he gives Barta the signal that Jacob is safe. Barta reveals that Jacob's walker was actually a gun powered by the miracle machine. She fires it at Darkseid. Darkseid survives the blast and knocks out Barta. With Jacob in his arm, Darkseid wails on Scott. Scott drops Jacob and Jacob starts crying. While on the ground, Scott pulls out a new Farron knife, jumps up, and stabs Darkseid in his empty eye socket with a homemade Farron knife forged out of the bones of Orion. Darkseid has been slain. Metron appears to be under the robe of Desaad, declaring that Scott has escaped death. Scott isn't where he should be, and that there is another world waiting for him. Scott is faced with the decision to either stay in the world he's in with Barda and Jacob, or go towards this new world that's waiting for him. Scott finds out that Barda and him are pregnant again. Meanwhile, Scott is seeing ghosts of those who died in this series so far. Orion, High Father, Granny Goodness, Darkseid. Of all of the people he sees, Scott has the most tender interaction with Oberon. Scott apologizes to Oberon, thinking he should have escaped, maybe he shouldn't have escaped, Oberon reassures Scott that the world waiting for him isn't any less real than the world he's in where he loves his wife and child. Oberon says, This, all this, it'll break your heart, and you can't escape that. But if you're good, there's someone out there who will help you put it back together. So Scott decides to stay with Barda and his growing family. So take two, <laughs> Camera Reads Comics, welcome to the very first episode of Camera Reads Comics. My name is Cameron, and I don't just read comics, I love them. So today I'm here with my friend Kyle Rice, and we are going to talk about Mr. Miracle by Tom King and Mitch Garretts. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Cam. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Um, first and foremost, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well... I am Kyle. I work for a school district, and I like nerdy stuff. That's pretty much it. So, back into it. Um, today, we are reading Mr. Miracle by Tom King and Mitch Garretts, but we're also going to talk about me and Kyle and our journey in comic books. So, Kyle, do you know why you're my first guest? Because I was your first apprentice. He was. He exactly was. Kyle was the, I want to say the Carrie Kelly Robin to my <laughs> old Batman, which isn't a good example. But pretty much, I started this podcast because I want to share comics with people. Um, for a long time, it was, I don't want to say it was a lonely fandom, but really, when you like something, you want to talk about it. And this is not the coolest thing or the most common thing to talk about with everyone. We are getting more windows into that with the Marvel cinematic universe being so popular and like really this platinum age of comic book entertainment we have coming out. But for the most part, it's like, I love the source material. And so Kyle was one of the first people to ever take my suggestions and start reading them. And so Kyle, would you share your <laughs> experience with that? Well, one day we were talking and you invited me to go to this comic shop in Long Beach, and I said, why not? I like looking at cool, nerdy stuff. And I went, and you said, here, buy this. And you made <laughs> me buy Ultimate Spider-Man Volume 1. And my life has been completely changed forever. You know, I do. I do. I w if, you, if you go to the comic shop with me, I will say buy this. You know, I can't. You can't <laughs> it's guaranteed. <laughs> it's and it's out of love, <laughs> mostly. Mm -hmm. So um, Kyle is my first guest on the podcast because he 
not only blossomed into someone that I went – that I gave – like, you know, just comics do, because you can just loan books to friends. But Kyle, I'm, he's my prodigy, because he also has started a pull list at, at our local comic shop. Actually, we can just say it's Pulp Fiction Comics in Long Beach. There's also a location in Culver City. Uh, follow them on Instagram. Do whatever you want, but they are loyal. So Kyle, I'm like, he's texting me weekly about Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil run. <laughs> and he's like, Cameron, did you check out what's going on in Detective Comics? I'm like, oh. Before this podcast even started, we were talking about Donny Cates' Thor runs. Mm -hmm. so. It's true. So, Mr. Miracle, here we are. Do you – did you have any interactions with Mr. Miracle before you read this book? Only in the Justice League animated series when I was a kid that I really didn't remember at all. Yeah. But I recognized him. But I had – basically zero recollection of who the character was and what he's about so not really he's very <laughs> very very briefly in the chess league animated series yeah so it's like i think he has one episode dedicated to him and i'm like that's awesome but yeah no he's very briefly in it and uh going forward from there what made you want to read this well i love mitch garrett's art oh my god i love it so it's good. so good i'll I'll look for countless minutes out of just every panel and everything in it. And then I know Tom King's super po popular right now and been reading a lot of his stuff lately. So I figured, hey, why not? And also, Mr. Miracle is a really cool character oh, yeah. that I wanted to learn more about. So first and foremost, Mr. Miracle, 12-issue maxi series, DC Black Label. What did you think? I loved it. I loved it because when I think of Mr. Miracle and when I say his name, I think of uh, 70s comics, oh. <laughs> like Pow, Kazam, yeah. and stuff. And currently for me, it's tough to get into that type of stuff. So of I was kind of worried going in that maybe it would be like that. But the the dark avenue that Tom King took, I really enjoyed it's it's crazy because he, like, he takes these new gods characters and he brings them down to like these human beings, which is – you want to talk about something that we can't relate to? Like I was – I'm a human. I'm like a broke col college <laughs> graduate now, but <laughs> broke college kid living with my parents. And You're not a super escape artist? I'm a, not a super escape artist. <laughs> and I'm not married to a freaking Amazon Viking woman who Tragic. grew up on the pits of apocalypse. Like not – not quite my most – not how I spend a Saturday. You know? <laughs> so, um, like, I think what he does in his dialogue is exceptional. And, you know, it's an interesting choice how they hired Mitch on mm -hmm. to do this art because it's like hyper-realism, mm -hmm. you know? It's very uh, – it's, it's a very grounded art style, and then he makes these big bombastic moments – he, in in our lives, these huge art spectacles, which is amazing. Okay, Kyle, in this story, did you have a favorite character? And who was it and why? My favorite character, I mean, is Scott Free. W why? What resonated with you? Well, you can easily see that this man's just broken. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer that we're all kind of broken. Oh, yeah. I mean, he definitely has experienced things in his life that we'll never experience. We'll never have to escape from an apocalyptic orphanage. I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people might. They like might. LA traffic, though, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> like... That's pretty close. It's not close at all. <laughs> but, and then to see him go through, like, everyday life of being a husband and then Spoiler, becoming a father and yeah. all these things. And it's just the mundane life after he went through all of that in his life and having to go through constant war with the two planets while also trying to live on Earth mm -hmm. is, I don't know, just intense. And I couldn't imagine ever having to deal with those things as a man because I know just normal fatherhood, I'm sure, is going to be the most difficult job ever. Yeah. But to have all those other underlying issues 
to go along with it seems pretty difficult. There's a lot going on, Mm -hmm. you know, in the story. And actually, I think Tom King strikes a very interesting balance in the way that, you know, I think it's issue six is just him and Barda talking about their apartment Mm -hmm. while they're breaking into the throne room of – I might be confusing issues, but the throne room of High Father. And they were just kind of talking about their apartment furniture and la, la, la. And you find out it's not anything about making space in a new room. It's about – they're about to have a baby, and right. that's how she tells Scott. And it's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's just so well done. But it's like it's it's very balanced in the ways that Scott is, um, you know, just a, a a normal guy who's also just trying to do the best he can with what he's been given. And Matt, you find out eventually he's been given this this ultimate power over the fourth world. And actually, which brings me to my next question for you, Kyle. At the beginning of the story, it gives you the context um, of the new gods and, you know, the world. And you said we were talking a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, the mythology of the new gods, whether or not it was clear um, in other mediums. How do you think the introduction did in this story, in the hardcover, for explaining the new gods to someone who's never uh, experienced it? Well, not great, in my humble opinion. Oh, like – were, was it clear? You know what I mean? Everyone's relationships with one another? Because that's something where it's like, I understand it, but I don't know if a new person would quite understand it. I literally think I know because of other research that I've done and talking to you and <laughs> listening to other podcasts yeah. about Mr. Miracle and the new gods. And yeah. so I kind of had that information, and I kind of was able to put two and two together of who people were. Like, it's pretty difficult to miss Mr. Miracle and Big Barda and yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and Dark Side. It's and, kind of on the cover, guys. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, people like Orion, maybe, maybe not, and Oberon. I don't really know, but yeah, yeah, which is complicated because, mm-hmm. like, I think that's one of the biggest. I want number. The thing I love about the story is it takes a B-list character and it brings him up to a pedestal. You know, it makes mm-hmm. it a best-selling book, and I want that for B-list characters. Like as much as I love Batman, Superman, and Joker selling all the titles, I love, I freaking love Green Lantern, and I like Mister Miracle, and I like other characters to get the spotlight. And so, uh, a book like this doing that is awesome. But it's it it's hard to try and get the clarity yeah. to other people because mm-hmm. like. You know, I also think the dialogue with Scott and Orion of like he's not my brother because they were ju- they just happened to be the two kids swapped to end a war. You know, and mm-hmm. when you think about it, Orion is Darkseid's son who is given to High Father, basically leaving hell and entering heaven. Mm-hmm. For Scott Free, that's the opposite. Yeah, he left having to go to hell. <laughs> you know, you, they kind of joke about it later, like, you know, when him and Barter are making up noises or, like, to yeah. go to bed. But I'm, but it's like, oh, man, like, and the thing that obviously this book explores mentally is, like, that really fucks you up. But mm-hmm. um, I just thought I found Scott to be very uh, – an interesting character. And really, I guess what I'm trying to say is – the way they characterized that was very interesting, but I just want those dynamics to be clearer. Mm-hmm. And I mean, given it wasn't something that you would have recommended me the very first time we went to yeah. Pulp Fiction, or it's not something I'd recommend to my friend who's never read a comic before. Yeah. So, I mean, I had probably two years of reading comics almost every day <laughs> under my belt. <laughs> I am so proud to hear that. <laughs> Subtle, single tier subtle flex but <laughs> i read almost every day yeah, yeah um but how did you feel about the characterization of orion like how did you feel about that character i liked it because how do you do the counterpart or the opposite situation yeah. to scott free he i mean Scott Free was in a terrible place and couldn't help but be good because that's inherently what he was. Mm. Whereas that's Orion, right. he is the actual son of Darkseid. And so mm. that 
is probably going to mess you up a little bit. Oh and gosh. then he's expected to take on this mantle and pedestal on New Genesis, and he's just angry. He's just angry inside and doesn't really know how to deal with that. And so seeing him and Scott Free interact is just – it's pretty – it's pretty wild. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get – you actually make a really good point. And I think, I think you know, it brings up another point about this story, which is you find it's very much about fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's how Scott has kind of received and, and processed his childhood being sacrificed and uh, how he responds to that, becoming a father, and then – how Orion does the same thing with his upbringing. Because, you know, really, when you think about it, they aren't family, which is something that Scott brings up often. Because people want to lump them together for being the traded sons. But it's like, you know, Scott goes on this beautiful monologue where he didn't even have a name, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oof, that's all brutal. <laughs> yeah. Think about it. So, um, it was, uh, I like, the, when I think about it in context of them, it's like, I like that they kind of let the disdain that they have for each other shine brightly because I think that builds really beautiful character moments. But also, I like Orion. Orion's oh, yeah. one of my favorite characters. Absolutely. But I'm like, I just felt like he was a mad dick in this mm -hmm. whole. Definitely. <laughs> I was like, I did, I, you know, you didn't like him, and then you really hate Light Ray. And frankly, I'm looking for red haired, uh, red haired people that I can relate to in my comics representation. And so I'm like, okay, well, why you got to be a jerk? So. For all, the, all of you that don't know, Cameron does have red hair. That's me, guys. I'm like, I'm like, shout out to Barbara Gordon and Matt Murdock. <laughs> Hold it down for my people. Both beautiful people. That's what I'm saying. And so, um, that's great. Okay, now, for continuity's sake, where do you think this story fits into continuity for DC? Do you think it's an Elseworld story? Do you think it's a standalone? Well... I mean, I think the way that they wrote it, it kind of gives all of us the individual interpretation of where it is. Because yeah. towards the end, it gives the whole splash page of the whole DC universe, and it seems pretty current, mm -hmm. the DC universe that shows up. And But, I mean, it's up to us whether that's in Scott's brain or that is what's really happening. That's the reality. So yeah. I, guess, I guess I like the idea that that's – what was actually going on in the DC universe at the time. And I, I like when he's in everyone else's story. So I kind of wish he showed up even more. Yeah. Oh, which is the best going back to B list characters getting their mm -hmm. day. Um, yeah, no, cause I don't, I don't know. Cause you know, I feel like the ending of this book, which really threw me through a loop, especially on my first reading, it's like, okay. The ending is Scott gets a, he's like, Oh, have I been dead the whole time? Do I accept this reality? Do I go back? Did I actually escape death? It's like, oh my gosh. And you know, it makes you doubt too. Superman has a hard time defeating Darkseid. Right. It's like, that's not, that's not an easy foe. Frankly, he's the greatest villain of the DC universe. Mm -hmm. And so, oh my gosh. And the idea that, the idea that they used to kill Darkseid, I'm like, was brilliant yes brilliant and they they needed that I'm that was like, kind of one of the climaxes of the story and it was literally just like how is this gonna happen i think one of the things i also love about this book is that there are stakes yeah. you know what i mean Huge. and you can play with that more in a book like this than you can a batman title i think right you know 100 percent. frankly like yeah they'll kill batman but they'll come back in six to twelve issues later you know maybe less i'm like I don't think Alfred is gone, people, okay? Um, but, like, that's what they could do in a story like this where it's like, man, okay, do I save the universe or do I save my son? What kind of father does that make me? What, um, like, all that, all that stuff. I just think it's so... That was one of the most gut-wrenching parts of the story was when <laughs> they're on the playground and they're swinging their kid back and forth and they're genuinely having a discussion about what they should do. Should they give their son to Darkseid? And possibly he grows up to be even more evil than than Darkseid? Or yeah. do they keep it? And 
It's like, or do I have my happen. baby that I love? <laughs> and you know what's actually what I think one of the coolest things about the story that that makes it so personal is that as this was being written, Midge uh, had his own son. Like well, he I had didn't know that. Literally, uh, Mitch had hit, had his like first child at the same time Scott and uh, Barda had Jacob. I don't know Mitch's child's name. It's not that important anyways. But um, <laughs> it's, so when you look at it, I'm sure a lot of those Tom King and Mitch are pulling from their own experience. But the art is directly, I think, Mitch's son. Yeah. And even there's a beautiful tweet that came out as this book was being written that where Mitch said, my it's official, my favorite comic book character is Jacob Free. And I'm like, wow. oh, like single tear. It's beautiful. So personal. It Love is. It. And it's like that's the kind of stuff, you know, that makes this story extra special, mm-hmm. right? Um so I have some kind of fun facts and like notes as we go into this, which I think make the story so much neater. Uh first and foremost, one of the things I love is that at the beginning of every issue of the series, it's kind of old style seventies writing of like I wrote in, in issue number one, for example, no prison can hold him, no trap can contain him. He is scot free, the worldwide celebrity sensation known as Mr. Miracle, and he is the greatest escape artist who ever lived. But can he pull off the ultimate trick and escape death itself? I looked this up because I was like, some of this is not adding up. I'm like, why are it's it's either is is Tom King writing old style or is he taking the old style? And if you look at the beginning and endings of every single issue, he took a Mr. Miracle issue, literally one through twelve, and he takes he takes the the intros and the conclusions from each of those issues and puts them in. And I was like, so literally issue one, that's what it says. Cause I cracked open my new God's book and I'm like, okay, issue number one, that's what it says for Mr. Miracle. And that's what he says for, uh, every single issue going in. And I was like, that is so cool. Wow. Did you recognize it? Or what did you think when no, you were reading no it? Like I, I just knew that part was super different and I yeah. was, I was kind of hoping for some random fun fact like that to where this was just from his old issues and, yeah. and stuff from the past because it was very different and, Seemed out of place sometimes, so I knew it had to have some sort of meaning. Absolutely, also, yeah. I have a fun fact for you yes. and for all the listeners. That New Gods book that you just mentioned, you also bought that the very same day that you took me to Pulp Fiction the very first time. Oh, my gosh. And oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was the Fourth World Omnibus by Jack Kirby. Necessary DC essential reading, I swear. That was when I was like, oh, this guy is very serious. <laughs> it was well over $100, I'm nearly positive. Oh, that, yeah. It's and a big fat book. we walked out of there. I had my $15 trade paperback of Ultimate <laughs> Spider-Man, and Cameron had almost $200 in comics. Oh, my gosh. It's free comic book day, and I spent I – I think it was like 250 bucks in comics, but I love them. Okay. This guy's <laughs> serious. But also, called out in front of the fans, the listeners, all <laughs> the copious listeners that we have. Well, um, just letting everyone know at home that you're for real, and you're not just some guy talking about <laughs> – comics so and he's funny. just seen thor the dark world oh my gosh i love it. oh my gosh i actually thought dark world i like it's great villain anyways <laughs> um back to your fun facts go back to my, what is, <laughs> fun facts things i noticed like uh, actually i'd love to get your thoughts what did you think about the nine page panel layout which is one of the pinnacles of this book you know every page is a nine page panel layout and which is actually i think don't fact check me or maybe fact check me if you want to know, but Watchmen is notorious for doing this style. And it's actually a very modern comic mm-hmm. construct where, you know, it shows time being people's reactions. It gives an emphasis on that. But this entire story, frankly, for the most part, give or take literally one or two pages aren't in the nine panel right. layout spread. What did you think? Well, going to Watchmen, I give the nine panel credit for me being able to follow that book. Yeah. Because it's so dense and so much is happening throughout the whole thing that the nine panel layout makes it so much easier for one new readers and I honestly just think any reader in general being able to follow what's happening. And I think I read a quote about uh, Mitch Garrett's talking about how he used the nine panel layout and he was saying along the lines of he doesn't have to worry about where the reader's eyes are going. And 
Ooh. how they're following along. And I was like, I definitely resonate with that because on big splash pages <laughs> right. and there's 70 different text boxes, I'm like, where do I go? And I'm yeah. like, that doesn't make sense after that. So the nine panel layout one, I, I personally just think looks better and is so much easier for the reader. And he was even saying it saves them so much time because they don't have to get people to look at it and follow along and they don't have to change everything around all the time. So I love it. I prefer it. (laughs) (laughs) To be quite honest. You know, what's cool too, is you kind of see within that, I think, uh, issue 11, which is the dark side, you know, page or issue, um, the spread when he's in Throne Room with Darkseid, and that's probably one of my favorite layouts, too, because you see Mitch get creative within those parameters, too, which is something right. that's so neat. It's like you can utilize this format, but also showcase something that you can do new. So, you know, he displays Darkseid and Desaad, uh across three of those nine panels at the top, and he breaks it. So he breaks the rules while also following them, which is really neat. <laughs> I was like, I thought that was so cool. And so, um, Going on, I think another another really important fact about this is I think that we need to recognize is that this book is an ode. It is a love letter to Jack Kirby. In what ways do you think you saw that? And I can sh- I have some more backed up, but right. Um. Well, to be honest, I I don't think I've read much of Jack Kirby's original work. I just kind of skimmed through some of his first, like Mr. Miracle runs. I, I don't really haven't read much into him. I haven't read a lot of his stuff. So I had a tough time seeing all that stuff, but Mm. knowing that this couldn't be possible with, without his brain and his creations. And I also know just the fun fact because of, who knows who taught this to me, but I do know that Scott Free and Big Barda, their relationship is based off of Jack Kirby and his wife's relationship. Oh my gosh, and Rosalind. So I do know that. I didn't know that either. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Um, yeah, so... I got fun facts too. Yeah, my bit, ba- Kyle, <laughs> the student becomes the teacher. <laughs> um, so, oh, well, that's so cool. And I love that because, you know... In a mirror kind of way, Stan Lee and his wife's relationship is demonstrated through Reed Richards and Sue Storm of the Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. So it's just one of those things that makes it more personal to you. But like, so if you look at Oberon, who is Scott's trainer, um, mm-hmm. you know the guy who was teaching his partner in his escaping feats. If you look at Mitch, draws him a little to look a lot like Jack Kirby. Really? Yeah, and he's smoking a cigar just like Jack Kirby would smoke. And But there's more explicit ones. Like, there's in issue six, I believe. I don't remember, but it's issue six. When Scott Scott is literally putting his hand on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and you see it's Jack Kirby's hand signature, and it says, kid, comics will break your heart. I was like, number one had to like put the book down because I was crying and number two it was just like number one so personal because Jack Kirby for those that don't know actually is the notorious king of comics uh if you want to think of most Stan Lee creations Jack Stan gave them their names but Jack Kirby gave them their faces Stan Lee didn't create Captain America uh Jack Kirby did I think with Joe Simon um but there's but there's so many like that. So literally, the cover of Amazing Fantasy 15, that was a Jack Kirby cover. Steve Ditko did the interiors. Uh, that's the first Spider-Man book. If you look at Thor, Journey into Mystery, that's Jack Kirby and Stan. If you look at X-Men, if you look at their legacy on Fantastic Four, if most, most of Stan Lee's contributions were done with Jack Kirby. Uh, so notoriously... Uh, for I, I I really don't know the reason, so I can't speak. But I think it was just creative differences. Jack left Marvel and he went to DC. And obviously, when he came to DC, he said, "Give me your lowest selling book. I don't want to put anyone out of the job. And give me um, your lowest selling book. I'll make you your best selling book." And he t- they take Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, who's another redhead in comics. Shout out to Jimbo. And <laughs> 
he pretty much uses that to introduce the Forever People. The the first appearance of Darkseid is in Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. And so he comes in and he gives gives DC the fourth world, which is like I'd argue DC's so he did all obviously exceptional, amazing creations at Marvel. He comes in and gives DC their greatest villain of all time. And so I'll argue to my death that Jack Kirby is the greatest comic book creator of all time. And is frankly, he died in 1997 or 98, and he's overshadowed by Stan Lee. And I love Stan Lee. Obviously, he's, you know, a creative genius. I will never bash him. But it's like he's overlooked in his contributions by Stan Lee. And so to see a book like this giving, you know, Jack the King Kirby his due is so magnificent. And so if you look, like, Jacob Free, Jack's real name is Jacob Kurtzberg. And if you look at Oberon's tombstone, it says Oberon Kurtzberg. If you look at Jacob Free, it's named after Jack Kirby. If you look at uh, what they, I think Barty gets pregnant again at the end, and mm-hmm. what they named their daughter, they're going to name her Roz. Or Rosalind, after Jack Kirby's wife. And so there's just things like that that's like, oh my gosh, it's a huge love letter. And like, of a creator that deserves it, you know? Absolutely. And so that's, those are the, those are a couple things. Oh, and then Funky Flashman. Did you know who that was going in? Mm Because that was something I had to look up. And Funky, I think they kind of painted him as Scott's entertainment manager, but he was a villain in the early Mr. Miracle stuff. Oh, wow. And they painted him to look like Stan Lee <laughs> like, <laughs> like in Mr. Miracle, which is kind of funny. Um, it's argued whether or not – because I had to look this up because I'm like, is it supposed to look like Stan Lee? It's argued that uh, Funky is – Stan's – is either based on Stan or Roy Thomas, who is – a creative creator that um, Jack Kirby had worked with, but um, those are those are my fun facts. I love them. So, one of the actually really interesting questions going from this is, what? How would you pitch this book to someone? Like, we're all about sharing comics, and so Kyle. If you wanted to get this book in someone's hands, what do you think you'd say to, like, pitch it to them? Well, I was actually talking to my buddy before I came over here, and I was kind of telling him, hey, this is what I'm going to go do. And he looked at me with just the biggest question face I had ever (laughs) seen in my life. He uh, definitely has never read a comic. He's barely seen superhero movies. And... I genuinely tried to explain who Mr. Miracle was. Mm -hmm. And I literally just started with, he's an escape artist. He escapes anything. And you really never know how. And it's really interesting. And I also kind of went into the fact of how dark it is and how someone who has just seen a few superhero movies wouldn't really understand the the personal toll that this book has yeah and so i kind of talked about that a little bit and i said it's so deep it's so dark it's so dense it's oh my gosh it's hurtful it it, is it's painful but it's so good and it's exciting and it also shows mundane life they make fun of californians and you guys want to look at a book that critiques LA. <laughs> this is his one. <laughs> you have to read the whole book to find that spot because yeah. it's a very quick spot. But I also kind of go into like the romance of it and the husband and wife mm-hmm. and their relationship. And something that I've realized in my comics journey was how much I need romance in my comics. Oh my gosh, really? I just need it. I don't know what it is. For some Good. reason, for some reason, Peter Parker and Mary Jane talking in their room is more compelling to me than Spider-Man dodging a bus. Oh my god! And it's for some reason more exciting to me. I can't help you guys. I'm a romantic. Good. Shout out to my girlfriend. She's great. Great. And... Don't try and help it. All right? <laughs> and that is what took two years of reading comics for me to find out is what I want in my comics. And this 
shows just the most realistic version of a husband and wife in a comic book. And so if you want some insights to how difficult a marriage could be or how painful it could be, read Mr. Miracle oh and you'll see it. Actually, yeah, I want to let's let's elaborate a little more or like explore like Scott and Barter's relationship. Mm-hmm. Like what did how did you how did you feel about that? Like or how did how did you feel they worked together? Well, I mean, the most compelling part about it is Big Barda was trained her entire life to be the worst. Yeah, and she's a female <laughs> fury trained by Granny Goodness, who is Darkseid's wife. She's evil. Yeah, and so she was bred and completely trained to be just the absolute worst and be evil and mean. And then you see her just in bed with Scott Free, mm. and they love each other. It's yeah. so evident. And to see them both come from constant states of war on both their planets and then to just be in bed or just talking on their on their couch in their living room and it's so mundane it's so normal life uh, i love it i love how they can one be the biggest badasses together yeah. on a different planet and fight whatever foe and then come back and just say what do you want for dinner yes literally and that's what that's what they do, and it's, like, so neat because, like, Scott, you know, throughout throughout the story, there's a waging war on Apocalypse, and Scott is fighting, you know, for, for his people. He becomes High Father, and he – Darkseid gets hold of the anti-life equation, which is what he's, you know, the equivalent of, you know, his infinity gauntlet. Mm-hmm. And so he's fighting for this – Scott's fighting this war that he's losing, you know, and so – He's on, he's on, like, Apocalypse, trying to fight Kanto, so they get sent both their armies home, and Bart is at home worrying about their child. And so, you think about, like, that's where Scott wants to be, and that's mm-hmm. what he wants to be doing, but he can't. So, um, it's very well done. And mm-hmm. I think you're right. It just, it goes back to shining on these, like, very personal moments mm-hmm. uh, between a husband and a wife that are larger than life. Yeah, it's two gods that desperately just want to have the normal human husband-wife, father-mother relationship, but are just tied to these crazy planets that are in a constant state of war and are tragically their homes, and so they just feel continuously tied to it, and they have the responsibilities of being the generals and leaders of the army because they are the most powerful and the best. Yeah, and and the best absolute best and then they just got to go home and cook dinner and they got to go home and take a shower <laughs> yeah and like uh and th- their love is sincere towards mm-hmm. one another too which is a very cool thing and also like something i love to see in my comics are strong powerful women like and barda is a great example of that and i love that i don't know if this is canon maybe cuz i just haven't read very much of mr miracle other than this story but you see how much bigger she is than Scott. She's huge. She's ginormous. And so seeing that is so neat. And uh, Is she bigger than Wonder Woman? I don't or know. Amazons? It depends. It just depends on how big your Wonder Woman is. I'll have to look that up. If you're reading Darwin Cook's New Frontier, Wonder Woman is big and tall, and my preferred Wonder Woman is tall. But if not, like, I don't know. I think Barda being a warrior beast that she is, like, is cool. And... I also love that I think you're right when you talk about the dysfunction in the relationship that shines through that is in real relationships, you know. Um, Scott has issues. Massive uh, issues. He does. And, and his mind has been really messed up for years. And so it makes sense. It makes sense. But she, but she, as his partner, takes on his baggage too because she loves him. So I thought – I think you're right. I think that was just really well done. Mm-hmm. That's that's probably my favorite part about the story is their relationship, and mm-hmm. I think probably the best part about them is because of how personal and how deep their relationship goes, and how similar it is to Jack Kirby's relationship, and that's probably why it's held true. I mean, to my knowledge, they've never been split up or anything like that, so yeah, no. they've always been together. 
they so they belong together. So. Yes. Oh, it's beautiful. Um. Okay, going into. What am I trying to say? Going into. Moving forward from this pick. Let's say someone reads it and they liked it, you know, because I don't know we read it, and we liked it. So, what is the? What would you recommend someone next to read in this vein? Like, if they like Mister Miracle, what would you have them read next? Well, to follow the writer and artist pair, <laughs> right? I would go right to Strange Adventures that is coming out currently. Yeah, at the time of this recording, Strange Adventures. Number two came out, I think, last week. Mm-hmm. So, to date this podcast. Really and let me, <laughs> oh my gosh, let me just, yeah, we'll date it. Let me Whatever. Just, <laughs> right now, the, oh my gosh, it's not only Mitch Garrods who is like hyper realistic, but they have Doc Shaner, who is one of my favorite artists ever. Such a good contrast. It is. And even, you know, you kind of see it, for example, in the Mitch. So Nick Darrington does the covers for Mr. Miracle, and they're all amazing, which is just – it's so anti – not anti, but just opposite of Mitch's style. And you see that in Doc Shaner's hyper-idealized version of Strange Adventures versus um, you know Mitch's very grounded portrayal. And it's yeah. just so well done. I'm like, oh, I love it. So, okay, Strange Adventures, is there anything else? Well, I'd I'd want them to read something something dark like this, and that's that's kind of been Tom King's kind of trademark is dealing with yeah. super realistic issues that are happening in the world today and that are super relevant and mm-hmm. and I don't know I mean super super contested and everything, but. Heroes in Crisis. Oh my was gosh! Dark. He went there. I went there, and I know a lot of people don't. That is but divisive. But I you're don't. Not wrong. I don't have the forever relationship with Wally West. Uh, I don't have all these ties to a lot of those characters, and to see such a tragedy in in a book, and watch everyone lose their minds over it, and be super divisive. I think I'd recommend. I'd recommend that book. Dang. See what happens. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, the one person recommending that book. <laughs> it's a good book. It's really good. No, I don't I don't disagree. Um, I'd say if you liked this story and you want to go check out some more things, I would recommend Watchmen because it is – That's a good one. I mean, Mr. Miracle is a deconstruction of the genre of, mm-hmm. or of the medium of comic books, and it shows what these stories are capable of doing. Um, so – I'd say Watchmen, which is just another deconstruction of the genre. You know, you want to see normal people in peril, uh, and you want to you see normal people trying to be something greater than they feel they are, go read Watchmen. Talk because, about dark. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You want to read something dark. Um, and then another one, I think, because I, I think Tom King's Batman is also a very divisive thing. I liked it. I read it. You know, I think. Did you enjoy it? Mm-hmm. You read it? Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. It was good, yeah. Um I think another one I like I like most though when Tom King takes a maxi series, you know, like this. He yeah. does twelve issues on a B list character, and so I'd say Watchmen. Or um I'd say Watchmen, written by Tom King. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Tom. <laughs> hey, we're proud of you, buddy. Oh my god, I'm so I'm leaving that in. Please <laughs> do. Uh, uh, Bloopers in. Oh, my gosh. I would say The Vision by Tom King and Gabriel Walta, uh, which is really why, like, I read that and I decided that I need to read this because that, oh, my gosh, that series. Can I be honest with you for a second? Yeah. I was going to throw that in as part of my recommended, but I know how much you love it, (laughs) and I really, really wanted to be right in knowing that you would recommend it. Oh, my gosh, that... Uh, you know what I was going to recommend, but you recommended too? Strange Adventures. So there you go. The student becomes the teacher right now. Always. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, that, you know, really, we can do an episode on that. Because cool. that's – I want to reread it, and that story is so good. Uh, but, yeah, you know, you just – he takes something that, you know, people people love and – or. A, a B-list character, and he shines a light on them. He gives, a, he gives us something new to love about them, and that's what – 
we want. I don't know. I want to love these characters. Did you officially get Vision number one? Yes. You did, didn't you? Yes. Actually, there is. I am submitting Vision number one, my copy, to CGC to get signed by Tom King right now. Ooh. And so it is currently in the mail, and it was received. Which Another is- fun fact to our history as apprentice and teacher. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think sometime around WonderCon or after it, I was like, oh, comic books are worth something. I think I've seen some at garage sales and the swap meet. Yes. And we went to the swap meet, and you spent probably an hour and a half looking through every box for vision number one. This was the same day as new comic book day of $250. <laughs> but yeah. It was the same day. Wow. But, yeah, there you go. Swap meet. It's great. Oh Until the God. people that sell them move, and then they're no longer there. Oh, my gosh. It's at tragic. That, guys, okay, just for the record, this wasn't just any swap meet. For my people that know... I found World War Hulk numbers one through five. I got Civil War number one, number f- uh, and number four there. I got like issues that were keys to me. I think I got a Batman Rebirth variant cover for number one. It was like a Tim Sale variant, and then um, and Kyle knows all these are now, which is great. Cause I don't know if you knew at the time, but definitely didn't. I'm trying to think. There was I scored at those. I got like crazy variants i'm like oh my gosh these are all worth it. i remember there at at that uh swap meet in the bins was a copy of i think it's it's daredevil 168 which is the first appearance of electra i'm like what and i couldn't afford it because the guy was like 300 dollars. and i said <laughs> i don't not not he for knew. you that's for <laughs> pulp fiction <Yeah. laughs> and so i got i think i got that big stack of books for like 12 bucks though which was just a steal so Go find collections out there in the wild. Mm-hmm. That's a different point. Swap meets are huge. Okay, and then my second question for you, probably our last question as we close out. What – if they want to get to know the new gods more, what are some things you'd recommend? So within the new gods, if, if they like Mr. Miracle and they want more of these characters, what would you recommend? Well, I'd – Definitely recommend the Young Justice animated series that is currently on DC Universe. It is pretty centered around New Gods pretty often. And, I mean, for all three seasons, Darkseid's been kind of the underlying villain, even though you see him, like, maybe once. But for an entire three seasons, you get a couple appearances. But, yeah, you get to meet a bunch of different New Gods, and you get to learn a lot about him, more than you would learn in this series even maybe yeah you're not wrong this is centered around scott yeah and barda but like you know in the in that show there's forager there's mm-hmm. the forever people there's there's a bunch of new gods i'm not even super familiar with all the new gods you know it's a it's dense it's so it's it's game of thrones mm-hmm. you know it's game of thrones for uh dc characters and like that's why the lineage and everything else related to one another is crazy but um you know, so okay. So, Young Justice. Anything mm-hmm. else? Well, another thing that Cameron so wonderfully recommended taking a look back at, which I had watched as a child but haven't revisited in forever, was Justice League the animated series and Superman the animated series. Who, which both have very individual episodes. Regarding Scott Free, Big Barda, mm. Orion, all your favorite characters from Mr. Miracle, they all make an appearance. And so yeah. Yeah, I I don't disagree, obviously, but there's a there's a couple, you know that's where kind of Dark Side became the number one villain for me. Uh was Superman the animated series because, you know, if you want to look to uh so here's some some episode recommendations. Towards the later halves, Apocalypse Now, parts one and two from Superman the Animated Series. This is my preferred version of Orion because while I do understand he is intense, he is an intense person, I think they capture it well there. He's like in your face and unapologetic because he's a guy fighting a war, and I get that. But I don't think he's – I think in the series he's kind of a jerk, and it hurts me. But yeah. – <laughs> But in Superman the Animated Series, Apocalypse Now 1 and 2, you get a really, really, really good explanation of what the new gods are. And 
I knew you'd have the titles of the episodes. Oh, memorized. And then I definitely didn't. That's part one. But then <laughs> the one that sticks out to me the most, because it's kind of, you know, the arc of the third season is the new gods. The next one is, it is called Legacy Part 1 and 2. And this is when Superman straight up, a an event happens. I'm not going to spoil that. Superman has good reason to go to Darkseid's house and beat the crap out of him. And you'll the ending of that episode is something I remember as a child on Saturday morning cartoons that kind of went over my head and I didn't get it. But I watched it as I got older and I was like, wow, you want to talk masters of storytelling, Superman the Animated Series, those episodes, Apocalypse Now Part 1 and 2, Legacy Part 1 and 2, amazing. And then there's a couple episodes of The New Gods. There's, there's a Scott Free episode on Justly Unlimited. Um, which, you know, it sounds like he's voiced by Brandon Routh. I forget who he's voiced by, but I was like, Brandon Routh bounce back. It bounces back. (laughs) But, um, it's, these are characters worth getting to know. And so here are windows of getting to know them. And what I have found in my time is that it's hard to choose a favorite comic book character. Yeah. Because if a character is written well. They will become my favorite, you mm-hmm. know, and so I'm like I love Daredevil, but you know when you think about who's been at bat for Daredevil, it's he has an all star lineup of creators yeah. who've worked on him, you know, and so um, moving forward, I would say that you should watch those episodes of the TV series and you know expect be be in the know for the New Gods movie coming out, written by Tom King and Ava DuVernay. Uh, I guess I guess that's what we have for you. Kyle, is there any closing statements that you have? Any Hey, wait. My last question for you, Kyle. Shoot. It could be anything. It could be comics, it could be movies. What is something that you are enjoying right now that you would recommend to someone else? Honestly, reading comics in general, I'd say is something I'd recommend. I I have a very good friend who never read comics but is in the same avenue that I was is one of the more nerdy people that I talk to and we love all the same things we have the same interests and I would I would recommend Ultimate Spider-Man volume 1 Oh heck yeah It's just the most per- going from where I started I was just hooked I read yeah. that I read those 13 issues and was like okay send me more Let me know. And Cameron sent me lists and lists of lists of pictures in his composition book. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) And so, yeah, Ultimate Spider-Man, Volume 1. I think I've reread it about five or six times. Oh, really? No, yeah, seriously. Oh, my gosh. It's perfect. I've read that story a million times because that was one of my first comic books, you know, I was given. And people can say what they want about Bendis, but... That comic is perfect. Mm-hmm. It's a perfect introduction, and you know who else shines? I arguably, arguably the greatest Spider-Man artist is Mark Bagley, because oh, like, yeah. you want to look at a guy who's done his time on Spider-Man. He has spent his time with that character over a hundred issues, plus all the '90s Clone Saga Carnage stuff that he was doing. Mm-hmm. That guy knows Peter Parker Spider-Man, and so, ooh, a thoughtful, another thoughtful, personal human book. So another recommendation for him is Spider-Man Life Story. Oh my gosh! Just came out within the last year. Jodorowsky, our boy. It's a beautiful thing. Good, good, good. <laughs> so there you have it, Mister Miracle by Tom King and Mitch Garretts. I am Cameron. I don't just read comics; I love them, and because I love them, I want to share them with the world.